of Herbert West, who was my friend in college and in afterlife, I can speak only with extreme terror. This terror is not due altogether to the sinister manner of his recent disappearance, but was engendered by the whole nature of his life work, and first gained its acute form more than seventeen years ago, when we were in the third year of our course at the Miskatonic University Medical School in Arkham. While he was with me, the wonder and diabolism of his experiments fascinated me utterly, and I was his closest companion. Now that he is gone and the spell is broken, the actual fear is greater. Memories and possibilities are ever more hideous than realities. The first horrible instant of our acquaintance was the greatest shock I ever experienced, and it is only with reluctance that I repeat it. As I have said, it happened when we were in the medical school where West had already made himself notorious through his wild theories on the nature of death and the possibilities of overcoming it artificially. His views, which were widely ridiculed by the faculty and his fellow students, hinged on the essentially mechanistic nature of life and concerned means for operating the organic machinery of mankind by calculated chemical action after the failure of natural processes. In his experiments with various animating solutions, he had killed and treated immense number of rabbits, guinea pigs, cats, dogs, and monkeys, till he had become the prime nuisance of the college. Several times he had actually obtained signs of life in animals supposedly dead, in many cases violent signs, but he soon saw that the perfection of this process, if indeed possible, would necessarily involve a lifetime of research. It likewise became clear that since the same solution never worked alike on different organic species, he would require human subjects for further and more specialized progress. It was here that he first came into conflict with the college authorities and was debarred from future experiments by no less a dignitary than the dean of the medical school himself, the learned and benevolent Dr. Alan Halsey, whose work in behalf of the stricken is recalled by every old resident of Arkham. I had always been exceptionally tolerant of West's pursuits, and we frequently discussed his theories whose ramifications and corollaries were almost infinite, holding with Hackle that all life is a chemical and physical process and that the so-called soul is a myth. My friend believed that artificial reanimation of the dead can depend only on the condition of the tissues, and that unless actual decomposition has set in, a corpse fully equipped with organs may, with suitable measures, be set going again in the peculiar fashion known as life. That the psychic or intellectual life might be impaired by the slight deterioration of sensitive brain cells which even a short period of death would be apt to cause, West fully realized. It had at first been his hope to find a reagent which would restore vitality before the actual event of death, and only repeated failures on animals had shown him that the natural and artificial life motions were incompatible. He then sought extreme freshness in his specimens injecting his solutions into the blood immediately after the extinction of life. It was this circumstance which made the professors so carelessly skeptical, for they felt that true death had not occurred in any case. They did not stop to view the matter closely and reasoningly. It was not long after the faculty had interdicted his work that West confided to me his resolution to get fresh, human bodies in some manner, and continue in secret the experiments he could no longer perform openly. To hear him discussing ways and means was rather ghastly, for at the college we had never procured anatomical specimens ourselves. Whenever the morgue proved inadequate, two local negroes attended to this matter, and they were seldom questioned. West was then a small, slender, spectacled youth with delicate features, yellow hair, pale blue eyes and a soft voice and it was uncanny to hear him dwelling on the relative merits of Christ Church Cemetery and the Potter's Field. We finally decided on the Potter's Field because practically everybody in Christ Church was embalmed, a thing of course ruinous to West's researches. I was by this time his active and enthralled assistant and helped him make all his decisions, not only concerning the source of bodies, but concerning a suitable place for our loathsome work. 
It was I who thought of the deserted Chapman farmhouse beyond Meadow Hill, where we fitted up on the ground floor an operating room and a laboratory, each with dark curtains to conceal our midnight doings. The place was far from any road, and in sight of no other house, yet precautions were none the less necessary, since rumors of strange lights started by chance nocturnal roamers would soon bring disaster on our enterprise. It was agreed to call the whole thing a chemical laboratory if discovery should occur. Gradually, we equipped our sinister haunt of science with materials either purchased in Boston or quietly borrowed from the college. Materials carefully made unrecognizable save to expert eyes, and provided spades and picks for the many burials we should have to make in this cellar. At the college, we used an incinerator. But the apparatus was too costly for our unauthorized laboratory. Bodies were always a nuisance. Even the small guinea pig bodies from the slight clandestine experiments in West's room at the boarding house. We followed the local death notices like ghouls for our specimens demanded particular qualities. What we wanted were corpses interred soon after death and without artificial preservation, preferably free from malforming disease and certainly with all organs present. Accident victims were our best hope. Not for many weeks did we hear of anything suitable, though we talked with morgue and hospital authorities ostensibly in the college's interest, as often as we could without exciting suspicion. We found that the college had first choice in every case, so that it might be necessary to remain in Arkham during the summer, when only the limited summer school classes were held. In the end, though, luck favored us. For one day we heard of an almost ideal case in the potter's field, a brawny young workman drowned only the morning before in Summer's Pond, and buried at the town's expense without delay or embalming. That afternoon we found the new grave and determined to begin work soon after midnight. It was a repulsive task that we undertook in the black small hours, even though we lacked at that time the special horror of graveyards which later experiences brought to us. We carried spades and oil dark lanterns, for although electric torches were then manufactured, they were not as satisfactory as the tungsten contrivances of today. The process of unearthing was slow and sordid. It might have been gruesomely poetical if we had been artists instead of scientists, and we were glad when our spades struck wood. When the pine box was fully uncovered, Wes scrambled down and removed the lid, dragging out and propping up the contents. I reached down and hauled the contents out of the grave, and then both toiled hard to restore the spot to its former appearance. The affair made us rather nervous, especially the stiff form and vacant face of our first trophy, but we managed to remove all traces of our visit. When we had patted down the last shovelful of earth, we put the specimen in a canvas sack and set out for the old Chapman place beyond Meadow Hill. On an improvised dissecting table in the old farmhouse, by the light of a powerful acetylene lamp, the specimen was not very spectral looking. It had been a sturdy and apparently unimaginative youth of wholesome plebeian type, large framed, grey eyed and brown haired, a sound animal without psychological subtleties and probably having vital processes of the simplest and healthiest sort. Now. With the eyes closed, it looked more asleep than dead, though the expert test of my friend soon left no doubt on that score. We had at last what West had always longed for, a real dead man of the ideal kind, ready for the solution as prepared according to the most careful calculations and theories for human use. The tension on our part became very great. We knew that there was scarcely a chance for anything like complete success, and could not avoid hideous fears at possible grotesque results of partial animation. Especially were we apprehensive concerning the mind and impulses of the creature, 
since in the space following death some of the more delicate cerebral cells might well have suffered deterioration. I myself still held some curious notions about the traditional soul of man, and felt an awe at the secrets that might be told by one returning from the dead. I wondered what sights this placid youth might have seen in inaccessible spheres, and what he could relate if fully restored to life. But my wonder was not overwhelming, since for the most part I shared the materialism of my friend. He was calmer than I, as he forced a large quantity of his fluid into a vein of the body's arm, immediately binding the incision securely. The waiting was gruesome, but West never faltered. Every now and then he applied his stethoscope to the specimen and bore the negative results philosophically. After about three quarters of an hour without the least sign of life, he disappointingly pronounced the solution inadequate. But determined to make the most of his opportunity and try one change in the formula before disposing of his ghastly prize, we had that afternoon dug a grave in the cellar and would have to fill it by dawn. For although we had fixed a lock on the house, we wished to shun even the remotest risk of a ghoulish discovery. Besides, the body would not be even approximately fresh the next night. So, taking the solitary acetylene lamp into the adjacent laboratory, we left our silent guest on the slab in the dark, and bent every energy to the mixing of a new solution. The weighing and measuring supervised by West with an almost fanatical care. The awful event was very sudden, and wholly unexpected. I was pouring something from one test tube to another, and West was busy over the alcohol blast lamp which had to answer for a Bunsen burner in this gasless edifice. When from the pitch black room we had left, there burst the most appalling and demonic succession of cries that either of us had ever heard. Not more unutterable could have been the chaos of hellish sound if the pit itself had opened to release the agony of the damned. For in one inconceivable cacophony was centered all the supernal terror and unnatural despair of animate nature. Human it could not have been. It is not in man to make such sounds. And without a thought of our late employment or its possible discovery, both West and I leaped to the nearest window like stricken animals, overturning tubes, lamp, and retorts, and vaulting madly into the starred abyss of the rural night. I think we screamed ourselves as we stumbled frantically toward the town, though as we reached the outskirts we put on a semblance of restraint, just enough to seem like belated revelers staggering home from a debauch. We did not separate but managed to get to West's room, where we whispered with the gas up until dawn. By then we had calmed ourselves a little with rational theories and plans for investigation, so that we could sleep through the day, classes being disregarded. But that evening, two items in the paper, wholly unrelated, made it again impossible for us to sleep. The old deserted Chapman house had inexplicably burned to an amorphous heap of ashes that we could understand because of the upset lamp. Also, an attempt to be made to disturb a new grave in the potter's field, as if by futile and spadeless clawing at the earth. That we could not understand, for we had patted down the mould very carefully, and for seventeen years after that, West would look frequently over his shoulder and complain of fancied footsteps behind him. Now, he has disappeared. <laughs>